So we're in this series called The Things of the Spirit. That's a phrase that comes from the New Testament. Paul, the Apostle Paul uses that phrase, talking about the things of the Spirit. So uh, we're about halfway through. This is week six, I think. Is it flying by? Is it going quickly or slowly? How does it feel? Is it flying by? So week one, let's do a quick recap just to savor it because... And all of these are on our, on our YouTube channel, on iTunes podcast, so you can catch up if you've missed anything. Um, but week one, we looked at the 10 works of the Spirit. So we did this comprehensive overview of what are all the different things the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit does. We looked at that. Week two, we looked at this, this idea that God is a relational God, and what we lost in the fall of mankind, was we lost, was God's presence. And so the story of the Bible is the story of God progressively coming closer and closer to us to restoring His presence with his people, and that culminated in the day, what's called the day of Pentecost, where the Spirit came in power upon his church, and uh, amazing things started to happen. The gospel started spreading, signs and wonders were happening, all kinds of incredible things happening. That was week two. Then week three, we started to look at the idea of spiritual gifts, that the Holy Spirit, the reason we receive power is for supernatural ministry, that God has gifts for us to use, uh, that there are uh, these flashy gifts, you could call them flashy supernatural gifts, and then, but there are also practical gifts as well. We've got a whole week, actually, we're going to do uh, diving into some of those more practical service-oriented gifts uh, because they're all empowered by the Holy Spirit. Then we looked at specifically at the gift of prophecy. What does the New Testament gift of prophecy look like? How does it operate? What are examples of it in the Bible? How do we hear from God? Uh, we looked at all of that. Then we, last week, we looked at the gifts of wisdom, exhortation, and knowledge. And how does somebody receive like a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom or a word of exhortation? How does all that work together? And today we're, we're jumping into this. Uh, we're looking at uh, the gifts of faith, healing, and miracles. And these three uh, together are being kind of put together today because, again, kind of like last week, these three, there's, there's a lot of overlap and similarity between these three. So we're going to dive into these uh, and unpack them and try to understand them today. Let's pray before we jump further into this. Lord, we thank you for your presence with us. We thank you for what you're doing in this time, not just in our church and in our lives, but Lord, in our, our nation, Lord, the stories of revival and other things you're doing, God. We're just so grateful for your presence being poured out. And we want to pray that you would fill us with faith, that you would bring your healing power, and that signs and wonders would be done amongst your people to validate the gospel message itself. We pray for that. In Jesus' name, I pray that anyone that doesn't know you today will come into your family, be found by you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So let's start with, let's look at the gift of faith to begin with. Uh, these three gifts actually um, appear side by side in the Bible. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 7, it says, To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And then jumping to verse 9, it says, To another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles. So sandwiched right there in the middle of this long list of gifts, the Apostle Paul mentions these three, faith, healing, and miracles together. Let's start with the gift of faith. Just as we've been going through this week by week, we kind of have this understanding with most of the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives, that there's a universal application to them. Um, that we all experience, like, for example, um, we haven't talked about this gift yet, but the gift of mercy, that's a spiritual gift as well. Some people receive the gift of mercy. And, but somebody, a Christian who doesn't particularly get this spiritual gift can't say, sorry, can't show you any mercy because just don't have that gift. Just not in me. Okay, there's, there's a sense in which we're all supposed to show mercy. We're all supposed to grow in mercy, but some people are particularly gifted to show mercy. Mercy. So in the same way with faith, somebody with the, because we're supposed to, you know, to be a Christian means you believe in the resurrection. I mean, that's the greatest thing you could believe in, is the most impossible thing, right? Somebody coming back from the dead 2,000 years ago. Weren't there to see it. There's no scientific evidence for it. There's historical testimony of it. That's about the best evidence we could find, but it takes faith. So all Christians have faith. We believe God for amazing things, but somebody who has the gift of faith, it goes beyond just, I have faith in the things that God says, it, it, I have particular faith that affects other people. You could maybe, one example would be if you got the level of faith that you might say, one day eventually, Hollywood will stop making Fast and Furious movies. <laughs> now that's faith. 
If you believe that, and if you can spread that faith to others, then you have the gift of faith. That's how it works. But this is the idea of the gift of faith is that you, it's not just private faith or personal faith, but you, you spread faith to other people. You affect other people with your faith. So we see an example of this in uh, the book of Acts. Let's put up this scripture here, Acts 27. This is the apostle Paul uh, towards the very end of the book of Acts, which is the, the story of kind of how the church, first churches got started, right? It says, for this very night, this is the apostle Paul talking, for this very night there stood before me an angel of, the, of God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that, I will be, uh, that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on some island. <laughs> so they're on a ship. <laughs> Comforting words. We will crash. <laughs> we will be shipwrecked. But I have faith that none of us will die. That's basically what's happening in these verses here. This is, could this be an example of the gift of faith? That Paul had this dream, had this image, had this vision from this angel. He was promised everyone's going to be all right. You're going to see, you've got to go speak to Caesar. It's, hey, this isn't a big deal. And Paul's expressing this faith. Now, all these gifts, we're told, we read it in Corinthians, they're given for the common good. They're given for the common good. So that means the gift, somebody with the gift of faith, the particular spirit and power gift of faith, it means that gift has to become public at some point. Right? It can't just be a private gift. Like, I'm just somebody who I just have, I just internally, man, if somebody, you know, if something is said or something could, there's a barrier, you know, if there's a barrier to something, man, I just internally, I just got the faith for it. It's got to become, it's got to be communicable at some point. It's got to be spoken. It's got to be shared at some point because it's for the common good. It's for everyone to be affected by uh, this gift. Now, just like prophecy, just like Allison is sharing this testimony about the women's retreat, and she says, actually, during worship, I felt like I got a revelation. That's in reference to what we've talked about previous weeks, about someone receiving a prophecy. It starts with a revelation. The Holy Spirit gives a revelation in the heart. You sense something. I'm getting something from God here. But then until you, it doesn't become a prophecy until you speak it out. And you say, I feel like this is what God is saying. Hey, there's an opportunity. This is the opportunity. Take hold of the opportunity. Don't miss the opportunity. But I wanted to burst into an Annie song there for a second. Isn't that a song in the, in the musical Annie, Opportunity? This is my opportunity. The second one, it's not in the original. Okay, that's why the... Have you guys not seen the second Annie with the Jamie Foxx? Fox? So good, so good. Recommendation there. Don't have any stock in it, don't have anything. Uh, really great, really great movie. The gift of faith um, is, is like that. It's, it's like you, you get a revelation from the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit stirs you in a particular way, and it's got to be shared at some point. It might just be in your small group. It might just be with one other person, it could be, but, or it could be with the whole church. Hey, God has spoken about something. Now, we can't confuse the gift of faith with optimism. Because there are a lot of us, some of us, and it's nice to be around optimistic people. We all need optimistic people to be around because, you know, life uh, is hard sometimes, right? And you need, you need optimism. But somebody who has optimism is, is, they just have confidence that they just have this innate sense of like, hey, things are going to work out, right? I mean, people don't even believe in God can be very optimistic. You know, very optimistic, non-religious people who just say, I just think things are going to work out. But people of faith who are optimistic would tend to lean and sit on scriptures like, you know, God works everything together for the good of those who love him, right? Just got general sense of positivity that God ultimately, hey, it'll work out. And that's great. We want to have that kind of faith. But the gift of faith is focused on something that God has said. It's believing the word. So there's a story in the New Testament where Jesus meets this centurion. So he's like local law enforcement of the time. So it'd be like meeting a police officer today. So Jesus meets this centurion and the centurion essentially says to him, well, if you say the words, if whatever you say will happen. Jesus is amazed at this. We've got this in this, uh, next, put up this next passage here. Matthew chapter 8. It says, for uh, I too, this is the centurion, I too am I'm a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. So this is an example. This centurion understands the principle of authority. That if somebody has authority and they command something to be done, 
It has to be done. It should be done. It must be done. And his, he believes in, in Jesus' authority. He believes in the word of Jesus. If Jesus says, I'm going to do this thing, then it's already settled in the centurion's mind. It has to happen because Jesus said it. That's why Jesus is amazed. He's marveled by this level of faith. We've got to pray, church. We've got to pray for more faith. And we want general faith, but we need people with the gift of faith. People that when, when we're facing hardship, when we're facing setbacks, when we're facing those challenges, we come and we say, for the common good, we've got to let this gift of faith come to the surface to, for people to speak out and say, I think God has said this, and I believe it's going to happen. Because doesn't that help you if you're struggling? If you're struggling to find faith, to hear somebody else's confidence, to say, I really believe God's going to do this. It, 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 it spreads. That's why these, these gifts are given for the common good. What about uh, the gift of healing? The gift of healing. Now, the gift of healing is closely related to faith. They're, they're, they're so related, in fact, that you, you could refer to them as first cousins. Or, or first, cousins, first cousins that got married. They, they, it's a, oh yeah. They, they, they're made, well, um, they weren't happy with just being related in one way. They want to be related in two ways. So uh, that's how f- close uh, faith and healing are. Um, yeah, I've got to improve the reputation of faith and healing now. <laughs> they're really good. They're, really, they're, they're closely they go, go together. One, one story that, that, that uh, exemplifies this is the, the story of the, the woman with the, the issue of blood. Um, a very famous story in the Gospels from Jesus. This is in Mark chapter 5. It says, But the woman, knowing uh, what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. So this woman had had this issue for 12 years. She spent all her money on doctors. No one could heal her. And she had faith. She pressed through the crowd, which she shouldn't have done in that day because she was unclean. And she's pressing through the crowd in a public space. And she touches the edge of his garment and she's healed. And Jesus, when Jesus says things like, your faith has healed you, um, some people get tripped up on that. We, we can struggle with that because that can be weaponized against some people. Like you don't get healed, then you just suck at having faith. That's what that means. Um, no, that's not what that means. Um, we can struggle with faith. We need to be honest about that if we're struggling with faith, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. Um, what we have to remember is we can't think of faith like it's a substance. Like if you were to make a bar of soap and you were like, you use the soap and you're like, well, the soap made me clean, right? It's going to do that. We can't think of faith like that, like I've got this bar of faith. And if I apply it, God has to come through with the thing I've asked for. Right? It, doesn't, it doesn't work like that. It's the object of our faith. So the object of our faith is Jesus. So we, put our, we don't just have to have general faith, like, well, I believe in miracles. I believe the world is a magical, supernatural place, so all kinds of things can happen. Well, that's, that's a kind of faith. But firstly, it's got to be faith in Jesus. The object of my faith is in Jesus. But then also for, for there to be some, some dramatic healing that happens, or even just a basic small healing, like my headache gets healed, or I've got a pain in my left shoulder, and God, any, any kind of healing that could happen, whether it's something severe or like this woman with the issue of blood for 12 years or something simple, it is, it's, a com- it's a combination of our faith plus God's plan, God's will. That there's a few factors that go into it. It's honestly a bit bizarre and, and weird to think about how that works, but faith is an important aspect of it. They're closely, they go together. And so when Jesus says, your faith has made you well, at the end of that passage, he says, what does he say to her? He says, be healed from your disease. Still has to be the word of Jesus, right? Still, it's, still, it's still weighted on the word, on, on the will and the word of God, on Jesus. Now, when Paul talks about uh, the gift of faith, we just read in you know, the first verse I read in Corinthians, he actually says gifts of faith. Sorry, healing, gifts of healing. We left faith, we're now on healing. When Paul talks about the gift of healing, he talks about gifts of healing, so it's in the plural. The only other spiritual gift I think that Paul mentions in the plural is the gift of tongues or the gift of languages. Got a whole week coming up. That might be next week, actually. Um, so if you're freaked out by the gift of tongues, don't come next week. Um, if you're, no, it's not next week. Next week is Travis, it's our anniversary Sunday. So we're taking a week off from the things of the Spirit, but we'll be getting back to uh, gift of languages. And uh, I'm going to make you speak in tongues that Sunday if you come. <laughs> I like that. I appreciate that laugh. So, okay, if you couldn't tell that's hyperbolic joke, then, then this, we're not the church for you. So, um, <laughs> all right, all right, all right. I'm here every week. Uh, so, 
<laughs> gifts of healing. So what this, some people, some theologians speculate that, could this mean that the Holy Spirit graces particular people, that there's not just like one gift of healing, but hey, I'm just, I seem, I have favor, like all Christians can pray for healing, and some Christians have particular favor and grace to see more healings, so they would have the gift of healing, but it might be that people can specialize in certain healings, potentially. Uh, that some people might have faith to say, you know, I just have faith to pray for pain. People are in pain, I just really got faith to pray for that, or people with more severe diseases, I've got real faith for that, or headaches, hey, I'm just a headache person, you got a healing, need a healing with that, I'm the guy, got the, I'm going to solve the headache problems, or it, you know, could it be even things like anxiety, hey, I've just got a grace to pray for people to be free from their anxieties, um, it could be that, so there's, there's gifts of healing uh, that appear to be, to be given to, to different people, um, also we see lots of examples when it comes to healing of laying on of hands, we talked about this in previous weeks, but the idea of when we pray for healing, we put our hands on each other and the Bible doesn't really tell us why we lay hands on each other. I think, um, could it be, hey, you're receiving power, you've got faith, the Holy Spirit's on you, there's some kind of anointing, there's some kind of moment of God's presence upon you, and as you extend your hand and touch somebody else, you, know, you put your hand on their shoulder, on their back, on their head, whatever, and, you, and you, you pray that you're actually imparting that, you're transferring that power. Could it be that? I don't know. It doesn't have to be that. God can heal you know, sovereignly. You don't have to lay hands, but it seems like that, that can happen. I also think that laying on of hands is also can be an aspect that stirs up faith in both the person praying and the person receiving. That, that, that it's an act of faith. So it's a very, it's a very small little step. But it's an act of faith to say, I'm, I, I, I don't want to just pray a generic prayer like, oh God, you know, would you help us feel better? But like, as I put my hand on somebody, I'm really trusting and believing that God's going to reach out to that person, that the Holy Spirit's going to reach out to that person and touch that person. That there's, that helps stir up your own faith. And actually, if you're being prayed for and somebody places their hand on you to pray for you, that, that, that can stir faith in you as well to say, yeah, I want God to do something. I want to be touched by God's presence and I want to feel that. And so actually, so it could be either way, it could be both or it could be one or the other. Um, but I think it's important that we, we follow that example from the Bible. We have an example here from the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 28. It says, It happened that the father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery. And Paul visited him and prayed and putting his hands on him, healed him. And when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. So this is an extraordinary moment of, of, of widespread healing. It doesn't always happen that way. But this is an amazing, this one healing, so that's, that's actually how these things spread, right? It's, just, it's like how faith spreads. One person gets up and says, I've got faith, and other people start to find faith. One person gets prayed for for healing, and other people start to have faith uh, and expectation for more healing. It starts to spread like that. Church leaders are also told in, in the book of James, James chapter 5, I think it is, church leaders are instructed that if anyone in the church is sick, that you can anoint, go to them and anoint them with oil and pray for their healing. Now, again, we don't want to get mystical, but there's nothing special about the oil. It's not like holy water or something, holy oil, it's just regular oil. You just get some, some extra virgin olive oil or some, you know, you could have coconut oil if you want a particularly nice smell or something, any kind of oil. And, uh, you know, you're going to put it on somebody's forehead or, you know, if, if, I guess if you've got a body part that's appropriate, you could put it on that too if you wanted to. There's different ways of doing this, but you could think about um, church leaders anointing somebody with oil and praying for healing in particular. They're only told to do this as a prayer for healing as well. And so you could think about it like communion, that as we, we come and receive communion together, yes, there's something very symbolic in that, um, but, but also we're, we're expecting that we're going to really encounter the actual presence of God as well, that there's something tangible. It's like a, it's like a, a lit, it's, it's hard to, communion is a weird one to describe because it's like you, you genuinely believe that God is with you as you're communing with him, even though you're also aware that you're acting out a ritual and a symbol. It's both, you know, that there's something that's happening. In that. And so the, the oil for healing maybe could be viewed like communion. I'm, again, maybe it's an activation of faith. As I take the oil and I'm placing it on, the, it increases my faith. It increases their faith. That we're acting out. We're, we're trusting God in this step that he might meet us. He might respond to our faith somehow. I mean, it's a mystery, right? God's got his will. God only does stuff according to his will. We can't really change God's plan or God's will, but... Can we? Why would we pray then? Why would we wrestle with God? Why would we ask for stuff? Sure, there's a way that we can affect what God does somehow. I don't know how it works. It's very confusing. The more you think about it, the more you get mad about it. But I think you just have to understand 
that God encourages us to pray, encourages us to have faith, encourages us to step out in these ways, to lay hands on, to anoint with oil, all these different things. And that in the act of doing those things, God does respond. Obviously, God ultimately is only going to do what's according to his will. But we can wrestle with him. And that's what the name Israel means. It means to wrestle with God. God's people are called Israel because they were, hey, let's wrestle with God. The other thing about healing is that sometimes healing can be demonic in origin. I don't want to get too much in this today. We're going to do a whole week on distinguishing, discerning spirits and you know, the idea of demonization and all that kind of stuff. We're going to do a whole week on that. Um, but just to say that, well, we have an example of this. Matthew 17, verse 18. This is in the ministry of Jesus. And he's second now by miraculous power. Uh, wrong one. Oh, we don't. Matthew 17, 18. I think it says... Um, trying to get into my, into my mind palace here. Sherlock Holmes it. Jesus, it's, it's, the man, it's the father who brings his son who's possessed by a demon. And he says the, you know, the demon throws him into the fire and stuff or drowns him. And so Jesus rebukes the demon, casts it out, and then the boy is healed. So in that situation, the, when, when you have a demonic spirit at work, you know, you're going to change your approach, right? If the sickness is caused by something demonic, which honestly, that's a freaky thing to even broach that subject with people sometimes. So this, um, the idea of... Well, I don't want to get too deep into this yet, but basically it's going to change the approach if it becomes clear that there's something icky going on, there's something of demonic presence going on here. It's going to change how you're going to, you're not just going to pray for healing, you're going to go for the root issue of, of the spirit that's at work there. And just, just come back for that week. If you're like, what's going on with that? Just come back. We'll, we'll, we'll cover all that uh, in that week. What about taking medicine? Is it lack, a lack of faith to take medicine? You've been prayed for. You've been, someone says, you've got to have faith. And you believe in God. Is it, is it therefore then wrong if you keep taking your medication or keep wearing your glasses or you keep whatever, you keep your boot on that you're supposed to wear? Like the doctor said, don't take that boot off. But we prayed for healing. So shouldn't you test your healing? Should you take the boot? Uh, it is, I just want to tell you, it's not a lack of faith to use medicine or use a medical device. It, it could be, I guess, but by itself it's not. Right? You, you, you have to judge your own heart. Like, do I actually have faith? Do I really believe? Like, you have to look in and ask God, God, help me with my faith here. But just doing is not. We have an example of this when Paul tells Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy, and he says, you know, drink some wine for your stomach. So this is the verse we have here, 1 Timothy 5.23. No longer drink only water, but also a little wine. Notice a little. A little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. I'd feel a little slighted by that. This is a public letter that lots of people would read. The medical profession that doctors and nurses who heal, who it's their job to heal people, that that is also a gift of healing. Can we, can we categorize a gift of healing that way as well? Because the knowledge they have to heal people medically comes from God. The skill they have comes from God. The resources they have comes from, it all comes from God. And so surely we should understand that if, if a medical doctor or a nurse or somebody administering, you know, someone doing a surgery or administering um, medications, whatever it might be, that we, we, would, we wouldn't say like, well, next time I hope God heals me instead of the doctor healing me, that we'd actually recognize God has healed me. He just went about it this particular way. It'd be you know, similar to you seeing a counselor and you get emotional healing. Like, well, it wasn't, you know, God gave them the gift and the ability to do that. Doc, what about Luke, the doctor? Luke, you know, the gospel writer, he wrote, wrote the gospel of Luke, wrote the book of Acts, those two books together comprise the largest amount of writing in the New Testament. He wrote more than half the New Testament. He was a doctor, good friends with the Apostle Paul. Doctors, the gift of the prof medical profession, this is another way that God heals you. If you just naturally recover from a sickness, do you just say, well, hopefully next time God supernaturally heals me? Well, wait a second, God gave you your immune system. This is healing. So anytime you get better, you say, I had a cold, now I'm better from my cold. Actually, you can legitimately say, God healed me. Because he gave you the immunity to actually deal with that sickness. Whether it's a doctor or a nurse, or whether it is by a supernatural hand, by a gift of healing that God gives, there's healing that happens. Now, and we have to be really, we have to be honest about this and say this. We shouldn't have to say this, but we kind of have to say this, that not everyone is healed. And even those that are healed, they'll get sick again and die. Healing in this life is temporary. I mean, praise God for it. When you see it, we've seen some healings. I've seen healings in my life. In our church, we've seen healings over the years. 
Legi- like real ones, not like fake ones, real ones. But also, you know, sometimes you see people who are just optimistic, and they're like, I just feel better. You're like, are you really better? I don't know. You get both happening sometimes, but not everyone is healed. We have this example from Timothy. Paul knew Timothy. <laughs> you know, Paul doesn't write to him and be like, increase your faith, or I'm going to come and lay hands on you and pray for you. He's like, drink some wine. We have this other example of this guy, Trophimus, I think. Hopefully we have this verse here. Uh, uh, 2 Timothy, no, it should be 2 Timothy um, 4, verse 20. This guy, Trophimus. Do we have that one? We don't have that one. Something went wrong in my slides. It got sucked into a black hole. Um, so he says, and I think it's, it's, it's 2 Timothy 4, 20. Basically, he says that he left this, this guy, Trophimus, he left him at Miletus because he was sick. So Paul was with him. And he left him because the guy couldn't get better. So this is the Apostle Paul. I'm sure Paul prayed for him. I'm sure he had faith. I'm sure Paul had a lot of faith. Paul had an encounter with the risen Jesus, right? He wrote lots of the New Testament, right? This guy had faith. He says, I left Trophimus because he was sick. Not everyone gets healed. Paul himself uh, had issues. He had some suffering that he encountered. And he personally talks about this. I think it's 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 8, verse uh, 12, or 12 verse 8, either way around, I can't remember exactly, it's one of those, but he basically, he talks about his thorn in the flesh, Paul's famous thorn in the flesh, where he, um, he says three times he asked that the Lord would take it from him, and then eventually, God's answer was, after three times, God's answer was, my grace is sufficient for you. So he stopped, he stopped asking for that. We don't know exactly what his issue was, there's some debate about the, Paul's thorn in the flesh. Some people suggest his eyesight was bad. In one of his letters, Paul says, you know, notice how big my handwriting is. Um, so it's, there's an indication that maybe Paul had bad eyesight or something, and that could be his thorn in the flesh. But he prayed to be relieved of it, and he wasn't. Not everyone is healed. Healing is, is honestly, the subject of healing, um, sometimes I'm excited to think about this and pray for it and talk about it. Other times I'm just, it's hard. Because it's a mysterious thing. Because you can be really disappointed with healing. And, and, and if you don't get healed, then, you know, there's always that, that annoying Christian that, like, says, oh, you don't have faith, or, you know, they, they say the wrong thing that, like, sticks with you forever, and you're like, oh, that makes me feel great. It's a mysterious, even Jesus, even Jesus was limited in praying for healing. So we have this example in Mark, Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. It says, and he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. So there, there, that's that strange combination of you've got to have faith, but also it's by the, the voice and the hand on the work of Christ. It's both. There seem to be b- both things happening. But G- even Jesus, this is mysterious. And then there's an example here as well where Jesus has to try twice. He has to have two attempts to see this guy fully healed. So let's put up this next one here. I think it's from Mark as well. It says, And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village And when he had spit on his eyes, I told you this is weird stuff, spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? Guy's like, well, I got mud in my face, so how am I supposed to see anything? Uh, And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. (laughs) Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. What, What the heck is going on here? I mean, this is like when this comes up in your daily Bible reading. You know, you're, doing, you're going through your devotional and you hit this passage and you're like, I don't know what to make of this. Jesus is Jesus. Why does he have to have two attempts? <laughs> Why didn't it work fully the first time? I have no answer for you. I'm sure there are some clever theological people who have got some insights into how this works. But it's the mysterious nature of healing. It's not just Jesus, though, who healed people. We see it in the apostles as well. So we have this example of Philip in this next one in Acts chapter 8. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. When they heard him and saw the signs that he did, for unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. Many were healed. Um, In my life, when I was a teenager, I've seen different healings over the years. We've there was a lady in our church several years ago who was healed of asthma. Um, I have asthma. I still have asthma. She was healed of asthma. I was not healed of asthma. We had that happen many years ago when I was a teenager. I remember I was in a, in a meeting, and I just felt like the Holy Spirit prompted me to pray for this gentleman. It was an older gentleman, and he had been walking around with a cane and limping. 
And um, I just felt like prompted to pray for him. And I was terrified to do this because I was like, I'd never done anything like this before. And also, like, he's old and he's limping. And, um, like, he's just old. Like, so aren't you, isn't that just normal? Like, um, so anyway, so I got a couple of my friends and said, hey, will you come pray, help me pray for this guy? We prayed for him. God's power came on him. And he was totally healed and threw away his cane. And we were, like, stunned. I mean, because I almost didn't believe it would happen. Like, I felt like God had said to me, go pray for him. But I almost quite didn't believe. I'm a very skeptical person. And, but he testified. He went to the doctor. He had, he had really bad arthritis. And it had totally got healed. And, you know, man, I wish I could see that all the time. Wish I could see that happen more often. But that was an example from my life. Maybe you've got other examples, other things you've seen. The, the, the unfortunate thing about healing is that we're all exposed to the hokey expressions of it, right? Where, and, and it's portrayed in our media, you know, especially the gift of tongues, those kind of things. They're portrayed so badly and they've been so abused at certain times that there are challenges to us as modern day believers. How do we go about a rich, authentic, biblical way of pursuing these things in a way that's not hokey, in a way that's genuine, where we're, 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 we're mature about it? Let's pray for more healing. Actually, what we're going to do is during communion, if you need healing today, we want to pray for you. So as we take communion later on, just get your communion to stay up front and we're just going to pray. We're not going to make a spectacle out of it. We're just going to pray. And actually, there's something powerful. I think there's something powerful about taking communion and asking for healing. I think in the, in the book of James, it talks about some of you are sick because you're kind of messing up how you're taking your communion. And, and so there's something quite healing about, let's do this communion thing properly and ask for healing in that moment as well. Thirdly, the gift of miracles. The gift of miracles. Let's look at this last gift here. Um, obviously, the Bible is full of miracles. It's a book of miracles. And um, what is a miracle? Obviously, healings fall under the category of, of miracles. Healings are miracles. Um, a miracle is essentially when the, the physical world comes under supernatural authority, comes under you know, the spiritual realm kind of seeping into the physical realm in one sense. That, maybe that's kind of a bit of a mystical way to put it, but uh, that's essentially what's going on. The, kingdom of, the future kingdom of heaven is kind of being expressed in the here and now for a temporary moment, and suddenly... The laws of physics don't apply anymore. Suddenly the things are way, the normal way they're supposed to be doesn't apply anymore. Something dramatic, something miraculous has happened. And any, Christ, any Christian could pray for a miracle, might see a miracle. Probably some of the most common miracles that Christ, modern day Christians see in our context are probably financial miracles. Right? You start trusting God. You start saying, I'm going to trust God what he says about tithing. I'm going to bring in that full tithe. That's going to stretch me financially. Almost I've got to tell you, every time I see a believer take that step of faith, they get blessed somehow. God provides. It's true. Amanda's here to testify. <laughs> We've been talking about that in our small group, right? God's do yeah, God, that step of faith of doing that. Um, one example in, in, the, uh, in the New Testament of a miracle is, uh, well, there's lots of examples, but Jesus, just, Jesus has lots of examples of miracles. And multiplying the fish, right? Peter's like, hey, I'm trying to fish on, all night long, catching the fish. And he's, Jesus is like, hey, Cast your net on the other side, and then he gets all the fish. Right? That'd be, that'd be one. Uh, feeding of the 5,000. Multiplying the, the bread and the, and, and the fish in that situation. Now, if you have that gift, hang around afterwards. I need some help with my grocery bill. And I, all I want is for you to have the opportunity to exercise your spiritual gift of multiplying food. That would be wonderful. I don't know if that's a particular gift or not, but the gift of miracles does appear to be a real legitimate gift. I don't know. It's a very outlandish gift, though, isn't it? I mean, honestly, like, yeah, I've, got, I just, I've never heard a Christian say it, but I kind of want to hear it one day at least. Someone just been, yeah, I've got the spiritual gift of miracles. And uh, just something just seems, just seems a little odd to, to yeah, don't, if you've got the gift, don't, don't, don't tell people you've got, you got the gift. Just use the gift. Just, you know, we don't, we don't need to worry about, about having the name of the gift. But we struggle with why. Why would God give somebody, because all, all Christians can see miracles, but why would God give somebody a grace to see more miracles than others? That's what the gift of miracles means, essentially. Well, in the authors of Hebrews put it like this, Hebrews chapter 2. They explain it this way. They're talking about salvation. Uh, it was declared at first by the Lord. So this is the message of the, salvation, the grace of Jesus. It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to uh, us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So this is why God does healings, 
miracles, signs, and wonders is because of what Jesus first attested to. Jesus came with his gospel message of grace, and then his followers, his disciples, the apostles, they spread that message. But then also beyond that, to those who didn't see, weren't there when Jesus was around, weren't there when the apostles were around, we have miracles that happen that validate the message of Jesus. When you see something powerful happen that you cannot explain in the natural, people start to ask questions. There's got to be something beyond this life. There's got to be, there's got to be a God. There's got to be something I've missed. There's got to be something going on. That's why God gives the gift of miracles. Not so we can do magic tricks or anything like that, but so that God can be glorified, so that people can hear the true message of Jesus. We have all these examples, right? Of Plenty of examples in the Bible of miraculous things happening through people's lives. Um, they don't happen to make us look like superheroes. They happen to make God look like the superhero, to make Jesus look like the superhero. We also have to remember that a lot of, a lot of the miracles in the Bible, almost all, actually the vast majority of them, they're one-off, one-time things. The Bible happens over thousands of years. And so what we've got to remember is, I mean, how many times does the sea get parted? It's a one-time thing. How many times do people walk on water? They happen once. How many talking donkeys are there? Yeah, that's, uh, that is actually a Bible story. All right, there's one. It happens once. It's a weird. I shouldn't have mentioned it because now you're thinking, well, what? There's a talking snake as well at one point. But uh, how, how did how a lot of these miraculous signs? They're one-off things, and so we have to hold this nuance. And this is. What, the human brain has a hard time with nuance, right? We have to have faith that God can do a miraculous provision. There can be a miraculous breakthrough. There can be something. Jesus, he curses a fig tree and it dies, withers and dies. How many times does that happen? It happens once. We have to have faith. God can do powerful, miraculous things. But we also have to understand the stories, when we read the Gospels in particular, they're long periods of con- time condensed into a short story. So you read it thinking every day they're just having all these miracles happening over and over and over again. And obviously you're around Jesus. That could very well be the case on certain days. But you have to understand these things happen over long periods of time. You have to get into Bible time. Bible time is a real thing. It's a lot slower than we would like it to be. And you have to realize for most believers, most Christians, maybe you might see a handful of miracles in your entire life. I mean, we could pray for more and hope for more and long for more. But we realize that actually even just seeking a sign of its own accord, Jesus says you shouldn't just seek a sign for the sake of that. It says that in Matthew 11, I think it is. Matthew 11, uh, 29, is it? We don't have that one. (laughs) Thank you, Theo. What does Jesus say? He says to the Pharisees, because they come asking for a sign, and he says the only sign you're going to get is the sign of Jonah. And uh, I'm not sure what that means, actually. I should have looked that one up. That's Luke. I got the, the, the book wrong. Yeah, when the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is an evil generation that seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So there's a wrong way to want to see miracles and seek the power of God, which is the spectacle way of doing it, the abusive way of doing it, or the test to say, yeah, if you can do something, it's like what, you know, people were jeering Jesus on the cross. You know, hey, if you're the son of God, you know, come down off of there, right? There's a mean-spirited, skeptical way or accusatory way to seek these things. Actually, that, that's, that's not what we're talking about. If we want to see a sign, it's because we've got mercy. For, we, want, we want to see pain relief. We want to see a breakthrough. We want to see provision. We want to see God glorified. We're asking for the right spirit in the right way. The apostle Paul, he brings blindness on this guy. This is a miraculous thing that happens. He's got the gift of blinding people. Uh, in Acts chapter 13, I think it should be. But Paul... Who was also called, a soul who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, you son of the devil. It's okay to say it sometimes, all right? It's in the Bible, you son of the devil. You, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, uh, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed. See, look at that. The result of a miracle is somebody found faith. They believed. The proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. 
We also see it, the apostle Peter, he raises a boy from the dead. That's in uh, Acts chapter 9. And Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed and turned to the boy and he said, Tabitha, so, sorry, turned to the body and said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her, presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa. And many believed in the Lord. Again, you see that connection between a miracle. Now, is, this a, is, a, is a resurrection a healing or a miracle? I, I tend to categorize it as a miracle because the person's dead. <laughs> you thought that was funny? <laughs> so morbid. Uh, we have this, it's not, but it's not just Jesus and the apostles. We have this example from Stephen as well. Let's go with this next one. This should be about Stephen. Just throw it up, whatever it is. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Acts chapter 6, verse 8. There was a guy many years ago in our church who was telling me a story. He was at a soup kitchen and they were you know, feeding the homeless. And so many people showed up at this one event that they were doing that they, they, only, they didn't have enough food. And people were in the line and they're thinking, at some point, this, this is going to run out. You know, the ladle keeps going in. We keep filling up the bowls, but at some point it's going to run out. When's it going to run out? And they gathered together and they prayed and they were really trusting God. And the people just kept coming through the line. They kept filling up the bowls and people kept coming through the line until everybody, everybody's bowl was full. And they said, we just don't understand how it happened. It seemed like a miracle. God did something in that moment. There's a thread with these three today, isn't there? Faith, healing, and miracles. There's a thread here of risk. I think more risk than the other spiritual gifts we've looked at in previous weeks. Because with a prophecy, unless you're prophesying something very specific about the future that just never happens, you know, which would be risky to do that, but you know, an encouraging prophetic word, you know, you, you, no, one can, no, no one can really say, like, well, that's not from God. It's like, well, it's good. You know, it's, it's, it's encouraging. It's not, it's, not, it's not a huge risk to share that. But to step out and say faith, to say faith, to, God said this, we're going to believe it, we're going to trust it. To pray for healing. What if they're disappointed? What if it doesn't happen? What if, what if I'm praying for an unbelieving friend? I said, you know, Jesus healed people. Let's pray for you. And it doesn't happen. What about a miracle? What if you give and then you're, you're, you're stuck somehow? What if, what if something, oh my gosh, what, ha what faith do we need from God? Because we, we take, now, we, now we're in the realm of like, it's got to be real or it's not. I've got to take the risk or not. Let's... Let's start worshiping. Let's start getting our, ourselves into that place of having a soft heart towards God and wanting to be open to seeing miracles today, to seeing healings today. And we're going to pray. What's the greatest miracle that's happened? The greatest work of God that's happened? It is the resurrection of Jesus. If you can believe that Jesus came back from the grave... Take that faith. Well, first, if you don't believe it, believe it. I believe it. Many here believe it. Trust in that work of grace because Jesus dying, the reason Jesus died is so that all our sin could be taken from us and put on him. That's the punishment of our sin on Jesus. That's why he had to die for us. And the greatest miracle is that he came back from the dead so that we could spiritually live and be made right with God. And so if you don't believe yet, put your faith in Jesus. But if you, if you are a person of faith, you're, you're a Christian, and you believe in the res therefore you believe in the resurrection, take that same faith. Take that same faith and say, I want to I pray for healing. I want to pray for a, a, a miracle. I want to pray for a breakthrough. I want to I pray for God to do something out of the ordinary. And, and trust, like, hey, if I don't see it, I'm, I'm operating on Bible time. It might take decades. Look, the, the ultimate healing, we'll all be healed in heaven, right? We'll all have perfect bodies in heaven. We'll, God, you know, in one sense, you could look at it this way. It's, it's very slow. The healing has started. It's just very slow. So when we, I guess when we're praying for healing, what we're praying for is we're praying, God, just speed it up. Just to, can we, can we kind, of, kind of like get some of that heaven right here, right now? And that's okay to pray that and ask that, but also to have the maturity to say this is mysterious that if, I'm, if I don't see a breakthrough, I don't see the provision I was asking for, I don't see the healing I was asking for, to say 
God has purpose even in this. In my suffering, God is trying to teach me something. God is trying to produce something, produce character in me. It says that in, in, in the book of Romans, that suffering produces character. We won't see it all happen in this life, but we can, perhaps we can see more than we do right now. I think the kind of Christians that tend to say, I've never seen it, are the ones that have never really asked for it. So let's be those that ask in a mature way, in a careful way, but with faith. Not making a spectacle, but saying, yeah, God can do anything. And He's with us. When you like and subscribe, this video reaches more people.